Hello and welcome. This is James from the DSO Imager channel. Tonight I'm going to show the processing workflow I did for NGC 6914. For this shot I used the Ascar 65 PHQ and for the camera it was the ZWO ASI 533MC. Now I spent a lot of time on this. We've, we're in the midst of an incredible uh, streak of clear nights. I mean we're going on three weeks here of night after night after night of clear and uh, I pretty much parked my scope on this target without the moon. So when the moon was out, I moved to a different target. So everything I got was, uh, we'll call it Bortle 5 with no moon. And uh, I got 914 three-minute subs. <laughs> so uh, total, total exposure, uh, total integration time is 45 hours and 42 minutes on this one. So it's a lot. I mean, the scope is a small scope, so, uh, you know, 65 millimeters, not gathering a whole lot of light. It's a little bit on the slow side uh, at f6, so I really wanted to um, spend a good amount of time. If, if I was shooting from uh, Bortle 2, for example, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't need anywhere near 45 hours to match these results. Oh, and uh, before I forget, for filters, I just use an Optolong uh, luminance filter. I just wanted a luminance filter to block UV and IR, and that was it. Now, in regards to uh, stacking uh, 914 subs, I did not do it all in one shot. And I basically broke it down into five parts. And so I had stacks of anywhere from 150 to 250 per part and I had five parts so it added up. Uh, the nice thing about that is that I was able to stack as I went and then just stack the five parts together for for the final stack and that is definitely a, a strategy that's good to use if you're producing a thousand subs here <laughs> like this. I mean if you're doing really short subs at, at uh, fast focal length it's something that you can run into if you want to try uh, lucky imaging with a planetary nebula core at you know it's it's a viable option now the native image scale of this camera on this scope is about 1.8 arc seconds so I did drizzle and the way I handled that is I drizzled each of the five parts and when I stacked the five parts together I didn't drizzle for that part alright so with that out of the way let's take a look at the data now this is the uh, 45 hours worth right here it's not stretched. This is just with the uh, the auto stretch. You get a good look at it, and I mean you can see how smooth that data is. And this this image actually was a very easy image to process. I spent more time tweaking after I did all the major processing, and then that's just the consequence of having nice clean data. Now color calibration was a challenge, though. Um, I tried using the um, the spectro, whatever you want to call it, where is it? Uh, yeah, spe uh, spectro photometric color calibration. So this is usually what I use for broadband color calibration, but it wasn't quite wasn't quite getting a, getting it done. The, the results were weird, and um, I ended up getting some strange tints to the red, and it just it, it didn't work. I tried doing color calibration the old-fashioned way. Uh, you know, with background neutralization. What I ended up going with and what worked out the best was actually doing the old school trick of using linear fit. And what I did is I used blue as the, as the reference channel and applied that to uh, the green and red. So how would I do that? So you just take this uh, color image and you hit this button and that splits it up into the RGB channels. And what you end up with is this here. So here's our red. Here's our green, and here's our blue. So I opened up linear fit, and you can see the blue's already in there. Uh, so with blue as a reference image, I applied that to the green and red. And what that does is it it matches the uh, the red and green to the blue output. And really, the the end result is this image when you combine it is pretty much color calibrated. And I'll demonstra demonstrate this here. So this this is the resulting image after running after doing the linear fit to blue and then using the LRGB combination tool to put them back together 
this is what I get. And the difference, if I uh, highlight this and link these auto stretch uh, channels and hit the nuke button, right? This is what it looks like with the auto stretch. If I do the same thing to this one here, yeah, there we go, right? And that's because we got a uh, strong green signal with uh, two green pixels versus each blue and, and red. So the C, what you have in this one, you always have to unlink uh, the uh, auto, the uh, unlink the channels when you do the auto stretch to see what you have. But now that this is the result we get with linked, we can use uh, normal stretching tools and uh, we're not going to have to mess around with the color too much. All right, so after putting these images together, uh, I went ahead and ran dynamic background extraction. And this is, let's see, actually. Yeah, so, all right. This is a result of dynamic background extraction. So notice the change in the color and everything. So now we're finally getting a nice uh, natural HA look here with, without having to do any work, by the way. <laughs> so that was pretty nice. And then this here is Blur Exterminator. All right, so we're seeing the impact that Blur Exterminator is having on the stars, doing an excellent job. Blur Exterminator is not generally thought of as a great tool for wide field shots, but the work it does on the stars alone makes it worth it. Um, I don't know that we're going to see a whole lot of increase. Yeah, so you see, that's the one thing. You don't get a whole heck of a lot of sharpening because of the image scale, but it's definitely worth it for the stars. So after uh, Blur Exterminator, we remove the stars, and here's what we get. Now, I want to mention one little odd thing with PixInsight here. Look at how this this looks, this color. You see how it's it's kind of, uh, there's, there's some kind of weird uh, gradients or colors here, especially when you zoom out. Do you see how that, that doesn't look right? That, this looks like there's something wrong here. What I've come to experience is that when the image is in linear and you use the auto stretch or a preview to look at it, there's something not right with the um, with the viewer function in PixInsight. So it looks like you have like these color artifacts or something's not resolving. And the only time I've ever run into this is when I've had images that had very high subframe counts. And so this one with 900 subframes, uh, it's where we're seeing this. But this is not, um, this is not um, accurately showing what the data is really uh, looking like. Because once you start applying the real stretch, all this kind of weirdness goes away. So it threw me for a loop the first time I encountered it, I don't know, maybe a, a couple of years ago where I thought there was something wrong with the data, maybe there's something wrong with the calibration frames or whatever, and, and no, it's just this, it's just this temporary uh, viewing that you get, and once you apply that permanent stretch, this, this uh, issue, this artifact goes away. And we're gonna see that now. So I made another clone, and then I started to stretch. Now, for stretching this time, I did use the uh, generalized hyperbolic stretch. I've been, uh, forcing myself to use this and I feel like I'm getting a better uh, a better handle on how this control how to, how to work this and you'll see through the steps um, how it works so here's that first initial stretch and notice all those kind of weird artifacts that we were seeing on the with the auto stretch is not there in fact the, this looks really nice uh, but yeah so I mean clearly some weird thing in PixInsight that's causing that and it has nothing to do with the data. All right, so a little bit more stretching. And yeah, I mean, you're really able to pull out the, the different uh, areas of, uh, well, I should say you're really able to pull out good contrast in here because this dust is now showing up really, really well. It's, it's interesting that the first time I processed this, which I'm not even, even going to bother and sh bother to show, and a lot of times when you look at other pictures of this, like this area here looks like empty space, but it's not empty space. It is, in fact, dust. It's blocking 
the light of the HA from behind it. And so when I'm processing images like this that have a lot of dust against uh, emission nebula, I try very hard not to allow these areas to get so dark that it looks like it's a hole in the nebula rather than dust in front of the nebula that's blocking it. Now, anytime you see a preview box on my images, it means I'm, I'm experimenting with different, uh, probably working on curves right now, uh, to see how it's looking in this, scrutinizing that area a little bit. And uh, I ended up here. Now, what I did is I took this, and I actually took it into Photoshop uh, to use the camera raw filter in Photoshop and mostly what I'm doing in there is uh, working the the dehaze slider and the contrast slider and um, uh, what was that other one uh, uh, clarity that's it so dehaze and clarity I do are the ones that I push the most and uh, but I will mess with shadows and contrast and I don't think I touched uh, tint or temperature in this one I may have boosted saturation here you gotta be real careful with this tool by the way it's really easy but it's really it, it makes editing the pictures easy but it also makes makes it easy to, to overcook your image and maybe on first glance up oh, there you go that that whole effect see how it looks like it's empty space there uh, and that was with the dehaze, right? So you can you can get a little carried away and end up overcooking your image. And maybe initially it looks good, right? Nice and contrasty, and that seems to get a lot of likes on social media. But when you actually start to scrutinize the image a little bit, I feel like it's it's lost too much. Like too much damage has been done to the image. Yeah, but anyway. All right, so I made those changes in uh, Photoshop, and I came back to PixInsight to finish the processing. I think this is the result uh, that I ended up with with the camera raw filter. So you can see subtle changes. Uh, I did increase contrast enough so that you get some good separ separation between all the different um, uh, intensities here. But it's not it's not super different from this one. And so that really is the bulk of the processing here. Like I said, this was a pretty easy image uh, to process. I think I spent maybe 15, 20 minutes tops to get from uh, from the initial dynamic background extraction to this stage. So it didn't take a lot of work. Uh, so after this, uh, of course, I had to stretch the stars. I stretched them separately. And you can see that I tried uh, different. So the thing with the stars is that there was, um, I was debating about how many stars to show and how strong I want the stars to be. And that was one of the main things that you see here. All these images afterwards, they were basically after I added the stars, and tweak the images and it just goes to show you how many uh, different iterations I went through before I came to a final image. So this was the first one and um, let's see yeah second one here not a lot of difference between these two I think the main difference is probably stars and star color and I got to this stage and one of my friends had because I so I have a local group and we have a little little discord channel that we kind of hang out on and so we share all of our work in progress pictures there and one of my friends mentioned that I could do a little bit more with the reflection the reflection bits to get it a little bit more bluer right so essentially create a mask and and boost saturation in there is really all all I need to do but he thought this would make this uh, pop a bit more so I went back and tried that and I also decided, see this is like minimal stars. I decided I want to get more of the stars in this area because I mean this area is really really rich 
and with stars there's just way more than than what you're seeing here so I tweaked it a little bit further and ended up with this so you can see more stars basically what I did is I created a mask uh, and protected the larger stars and then applied more of a stretch to pull out all of these uh, fainter stars that are in the image and you can see that I did boost uh, blue uh, excuse me the reflection area a little bit just by I used a range mask no actually I use a color mask uh, I think that's it yeah there it is so blue color mask I made a range mask of the blue that's not it but anyway and uh, with that range mask I boosted saturation of blue areas I think this area may have gotten a little bit too dark but uh, it was fine. So I thought this was going to be my final image and I was looking at it and thinking you know the stars are a little bit too sharp a little bit too strong. So I tried again and came up with this and basically what I did is I hit these stars with a very mild touch of convolution to smooth them out a little bit and that definitely softened the stars and then I thought this was going to be my final version and then I was looking at it <laughs> during that that 24-hour cool-down period I like to give myself and I decided you know what I actually like the harder stars so this <laughs> is the version that I ended up pushing out all right so uh, love to hear you guys thoughts on how this came out uh, what you guys think about using linear fit to do the color calibration and uh, on the final images, do you like it with the more stars that I have in this one, or do you like uh, fewer stars to uh, see more of the nebulosity itself? And um, do you think I'm nuts for spending uh, 45 hours on this? <laughs> so let me know what you're thinking. Drop a comment down below. Don't forget to give this video a like. And if you're not already subscribed, uh, please subscribe so you can uh, get more of this awesome content along with some of the stuff that I have planned for the future. All right, so everyone have a good evening and clear skies.